are a vital part of modern life. But in the grand scheme of human history, they're really not that old. They've only been around for about 140 years, and they've gone from these rudimentary, gas-powered, hand-crank start things to modern push-button starts with electric motors and cameras all over. And during this time, we've gone through extreme eras of innovation and change. We've seen the introduction of basic safety features like seat belts and airbags, all the way to the really advanced stuff we have today, like driver assistance technology and hands-free driving. We're in another era of extreme change right now, where we go to cars with electricity, automation, and the ability to communicate with each other. The more you learn about that era, the more fascinating it becomes. And that is our goal today. I'm Alanis King, and we're calling this Crash Course. Today, we're gonna learn all about cars in society, where they come from, where they're at, and where they're going. We're also going to talk about some really cool technology from our YouTube partner, Magna, which supplies a lot of parts you see in cars on the road today. So we're gonna break this down into four sections. The first is, where and how did cars originate? The second is, how are modern cars made? You might think that manufacturers just build an entire car and then they sell it to you. But in reality, they partner with other companies to create some of the vital parts on that car. Third, we're gonna talk about where automotive technology is right now. And fourth, we're gonna talk about where it's going. So let's dive in. Let's rewind to the beginning, which is the late 1800s. In 1886, a man named Carl Benz patented a motor vehicle powered by a gas engine. This would become known as the Benz Patent Motor Car. It was a three-wheeler and the newspapers soon got a hold of it. And in 1888, Benz's wife, Bertha, took this car on the first ever long distance road trip in automotive history with her two sons. They went more than 100 miles and she had to troubleshoot this thing along the way. And the publicity she got on this trip launched Mercedes-Benz and the automotive industry to where it is today. The automotive industry was on a roll after that. Ferdinand Porsche introduced the first hybrid in 1901, a hundred years before the Prius became the first mass-produced hybrid, and his car had an internal combustion engine that powered a generator. That generator sent charge to the wheel hubs to drive them. Electrification in the automotive industry actually has a really interesting trajectory. There were electric carriages decades before the Benz patent motor car in the 1800s, but in the early 1900s, gas engines began to win the technology race. So people and companies went all in on gas and we didn't really hear much about EVs until where we are today, where governments are kind of mandating we go that way. In the past 140 years, there have been tons of major advancements in car technology. In that time, we have gone from 10 mile per hour, three wheeled buggies to 2000 horsepower electric supercars. There is so much that goes into each individual development in the automotive industry, but there's also so much that goes into the cars that are in your driveway. And that's what we're talking about next. I've been professionally driving and reviewing cars for about a decade, but this year I have learned so much about where they come from thanks to our partner Magna. Magna is what's known as an automotive supplier, and suppliers make vital parts, systems, technologies, and sometimes entire cars for automakers. The Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon, Magna makes that. The Toyota Supra, Magna makes that too. Automakers and suppliers work together to create vehicles, and the relationship makes a lot of sense when you learn more about it. Whereas an automaker will do the styling and brand defining features of a car, a supplier will step in to do the more universal things like headlights, taillights, driver assistance features, driver monitoring systems, seating materials and arrangements, battery enclosures, door handles and latch systems, powertrains, hybrid drive systems, transfer cases, and more. 
When we walked into Magnus Tech Day earlier this year, I saw a ton of headlights and taillights that I recognized, and I had never thought about it before, but it makes a ton of sense. Automakers allow suppliers to make things like that so that they don't have to have all of that talent and labor in-house. The supplier can have it, leading to more specialized and high-quality products. The funny thing when you learn about this relationship is knowing how brand loyal some people are. Maybe you like one automaker and your friend likes another automaker and you just lightly joke about it with each other. But something a lot of people don't know is that parts on their cars can be made by the same supplier. Maybe you share headlight, tail light, rear view mirror technology, anything like that, and you wouldn't know because typically the supplier logo is not on those parts. If your headlights are made by Magna, you might not even know it because they're not going to say Magna on them. That brings us to our third segment, which is where is automotive technology today? And I think this is a fascinating question because 10 years ago, an economy car had buttons, a CD player, and certainly no sensors or anything like that. And today, an economy car has a touchscreen, a backup camera, and sometimes low-level driver assistance technology. And that's just the budget cars. The higher-end ones have satellite-aided transmissions, hands-free driving, digital keys, and all kinds of automated systems. When you get in a modern car, it is doing so many things that you are not even aware of. I've driven about 60 cars this year for my job, which is reviewing cars. And when you review a car, an automaker typically sends you the highest trim of that car to review. I find that these higher level trims share a lot of technology, including adaptive headlights, adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, automatic stop start, 360 degree cameras, auto park, electronic parking brakes, Apple CarPlay, and more. Tons of these systems exist because modern automotive technology like cameras, radar, and LIDAR allow cars to see what's around them. Road signs, pedestrians, other cars, and stuff like that. Sometimes they will visualize that on the screen and show you what the car is seeing. And sometimes they'll just use that information to feed what's on your driver instrument cluster. If you get in a modern car, you'll notice that sometimes a little stop sign will come up when you're rolling up to a stop sign. And also that information feeds the car's technologies like driver assistance technology. It knows what cars are around it and in front of it, and it can speed up and slow down accordingly. Cars also use this technology to feed emergency maneuvers and warnings. And sometimes they're a little early on the jump with those warnings. I was off-roading a Toyota Land Cruiser right over here a few weeks ago. And when I went down into a light little ditch, it was like, break, 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 break. And I was like, okay, I don't really need to do that. I'm off-roading. So it was a little early on the jump, but I appreciated the sentiment. I find that when I'm talking to new car buyers who aren't car people, they're not actually using the two technologies I think are the entire reason to buy a new car, and that is adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist. Adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist are what allow you to stay in your lane and speed up and slow down without your input. The car can do it, and that uses the technology that I was talking about, where the car can see what's around it. It is so easy to turn these features on. You literally just usually do it on the steering wheel, just like cruise control, set it on, pay attention to the road, and the car will take over those minute little inputs for you. So when you're going down the highway and you need to just slightly turn the wheel, you don't have to do that. And that makes a huge difference when you're on a long drive. If I drive four hours in a car with adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist on, it feels like it was 90 minutes, maybe an hour. I do not have the fatigue that I would normally on a long drive. Now, when you use these technologies, you have to pay attention to the road. With where automation is right now, you have to be ready to take over and turn the wheel or operate the pedals at any given time. You'll also notice that that technology sometimes will just slightly misjudge a lane and you have to grab it and pull it into the lane. But it makes such a difference in driver fatigue and when people aren't using it, I don't understand. Why would you buy a 2024 car and use it like a 2004 car? If I had to describe where car technology is today, it would be that the car can see what is directly around it. That is not a foolproof system, and sometimes you need to take over and help it, but it is a really good system. Now, how expensive that is to repair and how that technology ages over time is something that we will have to see. But for now, cars have a little bubble 
around them that they can see and react to. And in the future, the idea is to expand that bubble. That perfectly segues into our fourth and final segment, which is where is automotive technology going? There are some very obvious things. Battery technology is going to get better. Driver assistance is going to get better. Automation is going to get better. But one thing I'm really excited about is electric cars mimicking gasoline ones. And before two weeks ago, I would not have said I was super excited about this, but I drove the Hyundai Ioniq 5N, which simulates a four-cylinder engine, and an eight-speed dual-clutch transmission, if you want it to, and it was so good on track that I am really, really excited for the future and potentially simulated manual transmissions. But I think the most revolutionary car technology that we will see in the near future is not only modern cars getting better at seeing what's around them, but also getting better at communicating with other cars about what those cars see. When we went to Magnus Tech Day, we learned all about modern 360 degree technology and what's coming soon. And you have to think of it like as a car, you can see 360 degrees around yourself. Just like me as a human, I can turn and see 360 degrees around myself. When you're looking at me on camera, you can see what's around me, but you can't see what's behind me. And that is the issue that cars face. If they look at an object, they can't see what's through that object. But another new car with the same technology this car has can tell that car what's on the other side. So think about it. You're pulling up to an intersection in a car that can see what's around it, but it can't see through the building next to you. A car that's on the other side of that building coming up to the intersection from that angle can tell you what's on the other side. Other cars, other pedestrians, and your car and its automated technology, whatever level you are using, can then know better what is approaching it in the intersection. That makes everything safer. As cars get better about communicating with each other, it not only helps the car make normal maneuvers and emergency maneuvers, but it also helps you because the car can tell you what is out of your field of view, and it makes you better able to drive. This is really helpful for driver assistance technologies, automotive technologies, and even full self-driving technologies, because if a car can see more, it's better able to react to a busy and unpredictable environment around it. Motor cars, starting with that gas-powered Benz in 1886, have only been around for about 140 years. But in that time, we have gone from 10 mile per hour wagons to cars that can realistically see what's around them and react to that information themselves. There is so far to go still. And I really appreciate that you came for this little history lesson with me. So thank you so much for watching. And thank you to Magna for teaching me so much stuff about cars that I would not have known otherwise. If you like this video, Video, liking it or subscribing to the channel means a ton. And if you want to leave me a comment, I will be sure to reply. But otherwise, we'll see you next time.